Hi, this is the Educated Grunt here. Uh, welcome to my third part of my Chosin Reservoir uh, series about the U.S. Army east of the Chosin Reservoir. Uh, a quick side note, I had some issues with my uh, YouTube and Gmail actually uh, potentially being hacked and uh, YouTube shut my channel down for a day until uh, they got it sorted and I changed my password and security so everything is up and running and good to go on my channel and uh, with my Gmail. So with uh, no further ado, I, uh, let's uh, start. Colonel Faith's battalion was still in place when daylight came on the 28th of November, but there were serious gaps in the line. Although ordered to launch his attack at dawn, when the time came to carry out this order, Colonel Faith had his hands full trying to hold on to his perimeter to recover the ground he'd lost during the night. The night attack had been costly in casualties and morale. The 32nd Infantry Regiment had been t attacked by the 80th People's Liberation Army, which was many times their size and number. The night attack had been costly in casualties and morale. When it moved to Cho uh, when it moved into Chosin Reservoir, base battalion had been about 90% of its authorized strength, plus 30 to 50 uh, Katusa rock soldiers attached to each company. Morale had been very good. Although casualties during the night had not been alarmingly high, a disproportionately high number of officers and non-commissioned officers had been put out of action. In Company A, for instance, when Lieutenant Raymond C. Denchfield was wounded in the knee, his company commander, Captain Ed Edward B. Scullion, set out to temporarily take charge of Denchfield's platoon. An enemy gr grenade had killed Scullion. Colonel Faith then sent his assistant, S3, Captain Robert F. Taines, to take command of Company A. He was killed by infiltrators before he reached the front lines. Colonel Faith telephoned his executive officer, Lieutenant Smith, and told him to take command of the company. It's your baby now, Faith told him. The strength and determination of the enemy attack was also a blow to the morale. It now appeared to Faith's men that in addition to the severe weather, the troubles were to be compounded by fresh enemy troops. The cold weather was bad enough especially as there were no warm-up tents within the perimeter. During the night when they had been engaging in, in beating off the enemy attacks, the men could do nothing for a leap but put, pull their sleeping bags up to their waist and sit quietly in their holes waiting for another attack or for morning. The light machine guns did not work well in the cold. This is especially true during the night when the temperature dropped sharply. The guns would not fire automatically and had to be jacked back by hand to fire single rounds. The heavy machine guns, however, with the anti-police solution and the water jackets worked all right. Similar attacks had fallen against the perimeter and closing Colonel McLean's force four miles south of base battalion. The Chinese had overrun two infantry companies during the early morning and got back to the artillery positions before members of the artillery batteries on the uh, end of the overrun, overrun companies stopped them. After confused and intense fighting during the hours of darkness, the enemy withdrew at first light. Both sides had suffered very heavily. Colonel McLean had had another cause for concern. Soon after arriving in that area the night before, he had dispatched his regimental intelligence and reconnaissance platoon to patrol the surrounding areas. Twelve hours after the platoon had set out, no member had returned. Colonel Faith tried all day to recover the ground he'd lost during the night. The, the most critical loss was the prominent knob at the boundary of the two companies east of the road. Lieutenant, Lieutenant Richard H. Moore led his platoon in counterattacks on the 28th of November and succeeded in recovering all but the important knob itself. Repeatedly, Moore got his platoon to the bottom of the knob, only to have the Chinese, many of whom were firing American wood weapons, drive them back again. The friendly counterattacks were greatly aided by mortar fire and by very, very close and effective close air support by carrier-based Marine Corsairs. There were planes in the day, or excuse me, there were planes in the air most of the day. Frontline observers communicated with the planes by regular assault wire lines to battalion headquarters, where Marine Tactical Air Controller Captain Edper, Edward P. Stamford relayed the instructions to the pilots. 
The planes made some passes so close to friendly troops that several targets were marked with white, white phosphorus grenades thrown by hand. More frequently, the infantrymen used rifle grenades to mark their targets. In spite of these efforts, the Chinese managed to hold the important knob. Late in the afternoon, both Lieutenant Moore and the battalion sergeant major were put out of action by the same burst from an American 45 caliber Thompson submachine gun. One bullet killed the, uh, killed the uh, sergeant major and uh, another one struck Lieutenant Moore squarely in the forehead, raising, raising a bump and dazing him for a short time, but not in any other way hurt him. Unable to recover the main terrain feature within the perimeter, Company C organized a reverse slope defense directly in front of the knob. Sixty more casualties gathered at the bottom of the A station during the day. By evening, about 20 bodies had accumulated in front of the two-room uh, farmhouse which, in which the aid staple was, station was operating. Inside the buildings was crowded with wounded. A dozen more wounded, some wearing bandages, huddled outside to keep warm. During the afternoon of 28th uh, November 1950, a helicopter landed in a rice paddy near the battalion's command post buildings. General Almond, the 10th Corps commander, on one of his frequent uh, inspections of the front line, stepped out of the craft. He discussed the situation with Colonel Faith before leaving. General Allman had awarded three silver stars to members of his 7th Marine Regiment at Udamne the day before. And uh, General Allman explained that he had th three silver star medals in his pocket, one of which was for Colonel Faith. He asked the Colonel to select uh, two men to receive the others and a small group to witness the presentation. Colonel Faith looked around him. Lieutenant Everett F. Smiley was a platoon leader who had been wounded the night before and was awaiting evacuation. He sat on a water can. Smiley, said Colonel Faith, come over here and stand at attention. Smiley did so. Just then, the mess sergeant from headquarters company, Sergeant George F. Stanley, walked past. Stanley, the colonel cr called, come here and stand at attention next to Lieutenant Smiley. Stanley obeyed. Colonel Faith then gathered a, a dozen or more uh, um, walking wounded drivers, clerks, and lined them up behind Smalley and Stanley. After pinning the medals to their parkas and field jackets and shaking hands with the three men, General Allman sp spoke briefly to the ascended, assembled group of men, saying in effect, The enemy who is delaying you for the moment is nothing more than remnants of a Chinese division fleeing north. We're still attacking, and we're going all the way to the Yalu. Don't let a bunch of Chinese laundrymen stop you. Unfolding his map, General Allman walked over and spread it on a hood of a nearby jeep and talked briefly with Colonel Faith. Gestured toward the north and then departed. As the helicopter rose from the ground, Colonel Faith ripped the metal from his parka with a glove hand and threw it down in the snow. His operations officer, Major Wesley J. Curtis, walked back to the command post with him. What did the general say? Curtis asked, referring to the conversation as a jeep. You heard him mutter, muttered Faith. Remnants fleeing north. Lieutenant Smalley went back to his water can. I got me a silver star, he marked to one of the men who observed the presentation, but I don't know what for. Major Curtis had come up after the ceremony ended and saw first Lieutenant Alexander M. Haig, General Ullman's junior aide-de-camp and future Secretary of State under President Reagan and a four-star general. Uh, and he was uh, chief of the... Uh, uh, all the uh, allied um, forces in Europe also in the uh, uh, late uh, 70s, early 80s. He made an en entry into his notebook to have the official ex orders issued to confirm the awards. When Colonel Faith was presented with the Silver Star, he protested to General Allman that there were other men far more deserving of him and that they should receive the decoration instead of him. General Allman would hear none of it and pinned the decoration to, General, uh, to Colonel Faith's field jacket. After General Allman left to, uh, to return to Huguru Lee, as he ripped off the silver star from his jacket and tossed it in the snow, he was heard to mutter in a wo low voice, What a damn joke. Lieutenant Smalley removed his silver star and placed it in his pocket. This was witnessed by four or five men who were present at the informal ceremony. That afternoon, Colonel McLean came forward to Colonel Faith's battalion toward evening. 
However, when he attempted to leave, he was stopped by a Chinese roadblock between the two positions, thus confronting him with the grim realization that the enemy had surrounded his position. He remained at the forward position. Just before dark, between the hours of 1700 and 1730, on the 28th of November, planes struck what appeared to be a battalion-sized enemy group that was marching toward the battalion's perimeter from the north, still two or three days away. The tactical situation, or even during daytime, had been so serious that many of the units did not take time to carry rations to the front line. When food did reach the soldiers after dark, it was frozen, and the men had no way to thaw it except by holding it against their bodies. By the time most of the men realized the enemy was moving, was mounting much more than light skirmishes as they believed the previous evening. You'd better get your positions in good tonight, one platoon leader told his men that evening, or there won't be any positions tomorrow. As darkness fell on the 28th of November, Colonel Faith's battalion braced itself for another attack. The most critical point was the enemy held knob between the two companies east of the road. Lieutenant James G. Campbell, a platoon leader with Company D, had two machine guns aimed at the knob, and between his guns and the Chinese position there was a five-man rifle squad. Lieutenant Campbell was particularly concerned about his squad. He was afraid it was not strong enough to hold the enemy position. Enemy harassing fire, barely constant all day, continued to fall within the battalion perimeter after dark. It had been dark for three or four hours, however, before the enemy struck again, hitting several points along the perimeter as expected. One enemy group attacked the vulnerable area east of the road. Lieutenant Campbell heard that someone heard someone shout and soon afterwards saw several figures running from a knoll held by the five-man squad. In the darkness, he counted five men and shot the sixth. By, by who by then was only 10 feet from the foxhole. Expecting more Chinese from the same direction, he shouted instructors for one of the machine gun crews to displace to another position from which it could fire upon the knoll that the five men had just vacated. At that moment, Lieutenant Campbell was knocked down. He thought someone had hit him in the face with a hammer. Although he felt no pain, a mortar fragment about the size of a bullet had penetrated his cheek and lodged into the roof of his mouth. He remained with his gun crews. After the first Chinese had been driven back, enemy activity subsided for about an hour or two. While this fighting was taking place, General Allman was, was flying to Tokyo at General MacArthur's order. The Corps Commander reported to General MacArthur at 2200 hours on the 28th of November and received orders to discontinue the 10th Corps attacks and withdraw and consolidate his forces for a more cohesive action against the enemy. And that is the end of part three. Uh, please like, share, subscribe, leave me a comment, and uh, have yourself a wonderful day. Thank you for watching my presentation, and I look forward to you uh, coming back again. Bye.